마지막에 네, 유콘조 발표를 들어보도록 하겠습니다. We'll now turn to our attention to Yukon, our final territory. 먼저 첫 번째 발표자를 소개해 드릴 텐데요. 첫 번째 발표자는 유콘 지올로지컬 서베이의 헤드이십니다. 미스터 스콧 캐슬맨 님께서 준비를 해 주실 텐데 캐슬맨 님은 1985년부터 캐나다, 터키, 아르헨티나, 인도네시아 등 다양한 지역에서 니켈, 동, 금, 석탄, 다이아몬드에 이르기까지 다양한 광물 자원 지질 조사 경력을 보유한 지질 전문가신데요. 유콘 챔버 오브 마인스의 대표로 2회 연임을 하시기도 하셨고 다운솔 리저널 플래닝 회장을 역임하셨고 또 2015년부터 현재까지는 유콘 지질조사소에서 헤드 오브 미네랄 제올로지로 재직하고 계시다고 합니다. 잠시 뒤에 만나보시겠습니다. So first of all, we will invite Mr. Scott Castleman, Yukon Geological Service Head of Mineral Geology. She is a professional geoscientist with vast mineral explanation experience in Canada, U.S., and Turkey, Argentina, and Indonesia, across various commodities such as nickel, copper, gold, core, and diamonds. He served two terms as CEO of the Yukon Chamber of Mines and Chairman of Dawson Regional Planning and has been the head of mineral geology at the Yukon Geological Survey since 2015. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming him and if you're ready, please begin your presentation, Mr. Castleman. Thank you very much, uh, Jessica. Uh, welcome, everybody, and thanks for the opportunity to present. Uh, this is a joint presentation by myself with the Yukon Geological Survey and Dustin Bureau uh, from the Department of Econo Economic Development. Sorry, one second. Okay, so the Yukon is located in uh, northwestern uh, Canada, as you see here. We're uh, ideally located uh for servicing south korea there are three deep sea ports uh within close distance to yukon two in alaska and one in northern british columbia and then it's just a short uh, 7,000 kilometers to south korea the yukon is uh, well endowed uh with infrastructure uh, we have a well-established uh, road network three hydroelectric generating facilities one lng plant located in whitehorse 14 diesel generating plants uh, scattered throughout the territory, mostly operating to serve remote communities that aren't connected to the electrical grid, but available uh, if there is a shortage of supply. 95% of our energy is renewable. The majority of the communities located in the center of this map uh, are connected to the electrical grid. And as I mentioned, we have access to three uh, deep sea ports. We also have a modern environmental assessment and permitting process operating in the Yukon. Uh, of course, you, you may know Yukon's history uh, date back to, dates back to 1898 with the discovery of gold in Dawson. Uh, and I will talk about gold in a bit, but I'm gonna start uh, by another commodity or a couple of commodities that uh, Yukon is uh, well recognized for particularly related to the mining in the Faro mine years ago, and that's lead and zinc. Uh, we're richly endowed in, in lead and zinc in the territory. We've got uh, significant historic production from Kino Hill, Faro, the Wolverine mine, and the Sedena Hess mine. Looking at the historic production in the Kino district, uh, production originated there in 1913, and it has continued off and on to the present. It is primarily a silver producing region uh, from silver bearing veins. However, it has produced a significant, significant amount of lead and zinc. It's produced uh, 670,000 tons of lead and 190,000 tons of zinc, as well as the 6,000, 6, excuse me, 562 tons of silver. The current operator of the mines there is Alexco Resource Corp. The Faro District uh, began production in 1970 and operated until 1995, off and on. Uh, it shut down at that time due to low zinc prices. Uh, Faro is characterized as a SEDEX deposit and it has a historic production of 1.8 million tons of lead, 2.7 million tons of zinc, and 1,661 tons of silver. The Wolverine mine is a, a little more recent operation. It produced from uh, 2010 to 2014. Uh, it was operated by Yukon Zinc. It is a VMS deposit and historic production there was uh, 12,466 tons of lead, 114,000 tons of zinc, 
11,000 tons of copper and 289 tons of silver. It shut down primarily due to low zinc prices and the company went bankrupt. I'll talk a little bit more about the Wolverine uh, later. And Sedena Hess operated for a short period of time in 1991-92, shut down because of low zinc prices. It is a scar deposit with historic production of 14,550 tons of lead, 58,000 tons of zinc, and 39 tons of silver. So if you're interested in looking for lead and zinc deposits in the Yukon, as you could see from the last graphic, uh, the Selwyn Basin in southeast Yukon is the place to look. It's a slope to basin faces continental margin. It measures 700 kilometers in a northwest southeast direction, 200, meet, 200 kilometers uh, across that. It hosts sedimentary exhalative deposits, Mississippi Valley type deposits, scarns, mantos, and veins. So I'm going to start by looking at some of the uh, SEDEX deposits uh, in the basin. Uh, I won't talk about them all, but I'll, I'll do a couple of highlights. And of course, you see there Fireweed Zinc's MAC Pass project. Uh, uh, Brandon's going to be speaking more about this later, but I'll just point out that the last uh, resource estimate there was 1.8 million tons of lead, 3.7 million tons of zinc, and uh, over 2,000 tons of silver. The other Scott uh, mentioned the Selwyn project, which is right at the uh, Yukon Northwest Territories border. Uh, Selwyn is, is owned by Selwyn Chihong Mining, and it contains 5.6 million tons of lead, 17 million tons of zinc, and uh, yeah, that's it on that one. And lastly, uh, uh, the ferro deposit, as I mentioned, there was a lot of production up to 1995. There still remains a significant amount of ore in the ground there. It's in uh, control of the Government of Canada. It's an abandoned mine that the Government of Canada is cleaning up. And we're hoping that at some point they will release the existing uh, or remaining resources uh, for mining again. Remaining resources there are 1.5 million tons of lead, 2.1 million tons of zinc, 27 tons of gold, and 2,265 tons of silver. Also in the Selwyn Basin are a number of replacement type deposits, and those would include uh, MVTs, scarns, some veins, um, and, and uh, the Silver Range project, which uh, is a little bit problematic in its genesis, uh, but I'll, I'll show you what the resource is there. Uh, again, I won't talk about all of these, but I'll just touch on a few of the more significant ones. The Blend deposit is owned by Blend Silver Corp, and it contains 690,000 tons of lead, 70, 730 tons of, sorry, 1,000 tons of zinc, and over 1,000 tons of silver. Looking at the Yukon Base Metal Project, it's uh, controlled by Renegade Exploration Limited. It has 110,000 tons of lead and 940,000 tons of zinc. And Silver Range, uh, interesting little deposit, uh, contains uh, 100,000 tons of lead, 310,000 tons of zinc, 60,000 tons of copper, uh, 1,203 tons of silver, and 229 tons of indium. And the last uh, replacement deposit uh, of lead and zinc is the Mel down at the far south end, uh, also owned by Silver Range Resources, and it contains 100,000 tons of lead and 44, 440,000 tons of zinc. We'll now move a little to the southwest, uh, and we'll look at the Finlayson VMS district. Uh, Finlayson district has one past producer, that's the Wolverine mine that I spoke about earlier, and it may restart soon. The government is trying to sell off that asset. There are five deposits with reserves in the belt. Uh, there are Kuroko, Beshi, Sand Cypress type deposits, and one project that's in the environmental assessment process, nearing the completion of that, and hopefully will be in production soon. And that is the Kudzakaya project. So here is the distribution of those projects. There's, there's also one uh, VMS project up near Kino City, the MARG, uh, shown here. So I'll start by going through the numbers at Kudzakaya. Uh, it's owned by BMC Minerals. As I mentioned, it's in the permitting process right now. Hopefully will be completed very soon. It contains 360,000 uh, tons of lead, 1.2 million tons of zinc, 180,000 tons of copper, 2,821 tons of silver, and 27 tons of gold. And Wolverine, which I mentioned still in, in the control of the Yukon government, uh, remaining in the ground is 100,000 tons of lead, 750,000 tons of zinc, 70,000 uh, tons of copper, 
2,235 tons of silver and 10 tons of gold. We'll now look at copper uh, in the territory. Uh, the, there's significant historic production of copper uh, from the Yukon, from the Whitehorse Copper Belt. Uh, there's current production at the Minto Mine uh, and tremendous potential for copper deposits, mainly porphyry copper deposits in the Dawson Range Porphyry Belt. Whitehorse copper produced intermittently from 1902 to 1982. They're uh, all copper scarn deposits. And over that period of time, it produced 100, 130,000 tons of copper, seven tons of gold, and 77 tons of silver. The Minto mine uh, began operation in 2006, and it's operating to the present. It had a one year break. Uh, but other than that, it's produced steadily. It is a, a metamorphosed porphyry copper deposit and production from 2006 to last year was 240,000 tons of copper, uh, 0.3 tons of gold and 72 tons of silver. Currently it's operated by Minto Exploration Limited. Now, if we look at the Dawson Range proper shown in orange here, uh, there are a number of cop uh, companies operating there. I'll hide at a couple of those. Of course, uh, if you're talking copper in the Yukon, uh, the granddaddy of them all is uh, the Casino Project, uh, which Paul will be speaking about shortly. And it contains 4.8 million tons of copper, as well as uh, 500,000 tons of molybdenum, 5,324 tons of silver, and uh, also contains the greatest amount of gold in the territory at 663 tons. Another interesting copper project is Carmax Copper. It's owned by Granite Creek Copper Limited. Uh, it is permitted uh, with a mine permit. However, they did, weren't able to get their water license and the, the company is working on, on doing that now. Uh, the resources there are 230 million tons of copper, 100 tons of silver and nine tons of gold. We'll now switch to uh, nickel, cobalt, copper, and PGE uh, in the Yukon. Uh, so if, you, if you're interested in, in nickel, cobalt, uh, the place to look is the Kwani Ultramafic Belt, uh, which is located in southwest western Yukon, again shown here in orange. And uh, that contains uh, Triassic Ultramafic Sills, which host Norilsk type, type nickel, copper, PGE occurrences. And those uh, PGEs are anomalously high for nickel deposits, particularly uh, the uh, not so well understood PGEs or not so well known under, understood PGEs of osmium, iridium, and ruthenium. The largest uh, deposit uh, in the Kluwani Belt is the Nickel Shaw Project, and that's owned by Nickel Creek Platinum Corp. It contains 1.17 million tons of nickel, 670,000 tons of copper, uh, 70,000 tons of cobalt. 109 tons of platinum, 113 tons of palladium, and 19 tons of gold. Now we'll look at a, a few other uh, deposit types in the Yukon, uh, a, a little less explored for, a little less understood, but nevertheless significant. Uh, we've got uh, tin, tin, tungsten, and molybdenum deposits in, in a variety of Cretaceous age Mr. intrusive. Mr. sorry for the interruption, interruption, but due to limited time, please wrap up your presentation, sorry. Absolutely, no problem. Uh, so we got tungsten and scarns. Uh, Scott mentioned Mac Tung. I don't need to go on that one again. Uh, Red Mountain is a limited deposit of Tintina Mines and a JC Tin deposit in the south. And lastly, I'll just quickly talk about Yukon Gold. We've got one operating hard rock mine. Uh, that is the Eagle Gold Mine of Victoria Gold. There are approximately 120 active plaster mining projects in the territory this year. Uh, historic plaster production of 426 tons of gold in plaster operations and 24 tons of gold in hard rock. And there it's Eagle. This, these are the plaster producing regions and those are historic hard rock locations. Yukon Geological Survey offers all of these services. I think most of you have this presentation. You can read through them yourself at your leisure. And our website there has most of that data is digital. You can look there. And ECDEV also offers a number of services. Uh, you can go to their website. And if you have any questions, please contact either myself or Dustin. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Castleman. 네, 감사합니다.
이번에는 두 번째 발표를 소개해 드릴 텐데요. 두 번째 발표는 웨스턴 코포 앤 골드의 프레지던트이자 CEO이신 폴 웨스트셀스 님께서 준비를 해 주셨다고 합니다. 오늘은 유망 동 프로젝트에 대해서 소개를 해 주신다고 하는데요. 잠시 연세에 대해서 소개를 드리자면 폴 웨스트셀스는 광업 분야에서 25년 이상의 경력을 보유하신 전문가이십니다. 또 메탈루지컬 엔지니어링 박사학위를 취득하시고 BHP, 플레이셀돔, 그리고 베릭 등의 유수의 광업기업에서 요직을 두루 거치셨고요. 2006년부터 현재까지는 웨스턴 코퍼 앤드 골드의 CEO로 재직 중이십니다. 잠시 뒤에 화면으로 함께 만나보시겠습니다. So we we'll would like to invite our second presenter from UConn, a president and CEO of Western Copper and Gold Corporation, Dr. Paul Westells, and he will be sharing with us the Casino Copper project today. So Dr. Westells is a mining expert with more than 25 years of experience and had held key positions in leading mining companies such as BHP, a placer dome and a barrack, and has been serving as Western Copper and Gold CEO since 2006. So we're looking forward to learning more about your Cooper project. So doctor, if you're ready, the floor is yours. You may begin your presentation. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And, and thank you to Corez and uh, Kenor for giving me this opportunity to present uh, about Western Copper and Gold. Uh, Western Copper and Gold has one asset, uh, as was alluded to, which is the Casino Copper Gold Project located up in the Yukon. Uh, this is standard disclaimer. Uh, please review before making any investment decision. So a, a lot of this has been a, a bit of a transformative year for the company. And I'd like to sort of just start off by um, talking about a, a major investment that we just uh, closed approximately one month ago by Rio Tinto. Uh, Rio Tinto, for most of you who know who they are, is a, one of the top mining companies in the world. Uh, they've made a $25.6 million investment in, in Western Copper and Gold for 8% for of the company. And, and really this is to allow them to spend approximately the next uh, 18 months looking at the casino project with the idea that they will make a further investment uh, and, and get a majority ownership uh, at that time if, if their uh, additional due diligence uh, is, is satisfactory. And so this, this was a significant event for, for us as a company. Uh, and uh, we've been very, very pleased to have Rio Tinto as a partner uh, moving uh, forward. So let's talk quickly about the uh, casino project. Uh, this is one of the largest copper gold projects in Canada. We have a new PA that we released last week, which shows very, very robust economics and a long life. We have a strategic investment by Rio Tinto, which I briefly covered. Uh, we're located, located in the Yukon. We love being in the Yukon. We think it's a great district, great permitting uh, process. And, and we have, a, as a company, have continued to add value. So first, starting off with, with the resource, uh, and, and Scott uh, gave you the metric version. I'm going to give you the, the non-metric version. Uh, total contained metal is 21 million ounces of gold and 11 billion pounds of copper and also significant molly and, and a little bit of silver. And when we look at where the value is in the deposit, you can see that about 40% of the value in the deposit is from copper, 40% from gold, and 20% from molybdenum. So it is truly a copper gold project and really depending on the commodity prices of the day, it ends up being a little bit more gold or a little bit more copper. Um, going through and, and looking at our, our recently released BEA, you can see that uh, you know th we are now contemplating developing this project as a two-phase project. When we look at the first phase, and this is the first 25 years of mining, we're looking at a net present value of 2.3 billion an IRR of 20%. Uh, the strip ratio, which is one of the reasons why this project works as well as it, it does, is at an industry low of, of less than 0.4 to 1, and that results in a payback of three years. And I, I want to point out that this is at a, a long-term copper price of $3.35 per pound and a gold price of $1,600 an ounce. 
that's the phase one when we look at the the, the two phase development and, and so this is adding the second phase that brings the mine life up to 47 years that brings the life of mine cash flow up to close to 12 billion so you know, very large resource very large long mine life i think it's fairly clear why we managed to uh, get the investment from rio tinto this is a certainly a a large company project in terms of moving it forward so diving in now in, in a bit more detail and, and looking at the resource, there, there's sort of two parts and, and two processes, starting out with the surface of the deposit. And I want to point out that this is right at the surface. There is uh, no overburden really to speak of on this project at all. The surface of the deposit is enriched in gold and depleted in copper. And that this gets mined off first and goes on to a gold heap leach. That's 220 million tons at 0.3%. Uh, 0.3 gram per ton uh, gold equivalent. Uh, beneath that is, and shown here is, is the main deposit. And, and this is the mill feed. And, and that total resource is 2.2 billion tons at 0.36 copper equivalent uh, in, in measured and indicated, and then an inferred resource, which adds another 1.4 billion tons. And when we look at this cross section, I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, everything in blue is ore and everything in, in uh, brown is waste. And importantly is, is what's shown here in red. And, and what's shown here in red is, is material that's, that's almost double the grade of, of the rest of the deposit. It's really the core of the deposit. That's where we start mining. And you know, as I'll show you, it comes out quite a bit higher grade and, and really helps drive the good economics of the project. Um, and this is shown here. And so when we look at the grade over the first four years, we're looking at grades of, of 0.72 copper equivalent. Then over that phase one, that first 25 years, we're close to 0.5 copper equivalent. And then over the life of mine, uh, a little less than 0.4. And if we look at mines in this jurisdiction, sort of in Western Canada, Copper Mountain, Gibraltar, Highland Valley, these are all located just to the south of us in British Columbia. They're all mining around 0.2 to 0.3 copper equivalent. When you look at a couple of the newer mines uh, just south of us, Mount Milligan and Red Crest, they're sitting right where, where we are in terms of between our, our first phase and our first four years, a little over 0.5. The other thing I want to talk briefly about is, is our road. Uh, this has been a bit of a theme, I'm sure, as, as you listen to these conversations or these presentations about Northern Canada, getting access and getting access road is absolutely key. We were very happy. Uh, this is the end of 2017 and that's our Prime Minister, uh, Justin Trudeau, and the person standing next to him is the uh, Premier of the Yukon, uh, uh, Premier Silver. They made an, an announcement of a major infrastructure investment in, into the Yukon, and one of those was the road to our casino project. So that uh, investment is $130 million, includes full funding of the first half of the road shown here in purple, and then 30% of the funding of, of the second half of the road. I'm pleased to announce that uh, flash forward uh, almost four years now, and where we're sitting right now, is that uh, there's agreements with the First Nations on the first section of the road. They've brought the project through environmental assessment and they expect to be breaking ground on that this year. A little bit more about the economics. Uh, we talked about this being a 2.3 billion net present value and a 20% IRR after tax at uh, 335 copper and $1,600 gold. I'd like to also sort of point out, um, you know, our our cash flow of, of $9 billion over the life of mine. And again, this is just the phase one. And if you look at our costs, you're looking at a net smelter return and what the value is of a ton of ore of close to $30. And that space, you know, compares very favorably to an operating cost of under $10 per ton. And if we want to look at, at uh, other commodity prices, you can see that if we look at closer to where we've been, uh, 450 copper and, and $2,000 gold, if you run those commodity prices in, you'll see that we get very, very quickly to a um, net present value at sort of spot values of closer to four and a half billion as compared to the 2.3 billion at those long-term conservative commodity prices. 
And you know, these projects certainly uh, big projects. Uh, they don't come cheap. Uh, it is, does have a capital cost of 3.2 billion. But if you compare this to a number of the large copper projects being developed around the world, you'll see that it compares uh, very favorably. And similarly, if you look at the cash cost, and this is mostly because of all the byproducts, you can see the byproduct credits. It actually is a, has a cash cost of negative $1.13 per pound of copper, which obviously puts it very, very well suited on this uh, operating cost curve. So to summarize, the casino project is a project that, that hits uh, a number of the boxes. We have a company, as a company, have uh, done a very sort of good job of moving it forward. Um, you know, last year we updated the resource. This year it's a PEA and we brought in uh, Rio Tinto to sell, help us move the project forward. And then moving forward, we'll, we will look to turn this PEA into a feasibility study and get back into the permitting process. So at that point, I will uh, pass uh, the uh, podium uh, back to you. Thank you so much for your presentation, Mr. Castleman. Thank you so much. 네, 이렇게 저희 발표를 들어보았습니다. 이어서 세 번째 발표이자 오늘 웨비나의 마지막 발표를 소개해드릴 텐데요. 마지막 세 번째 발표는 Fire with Jinx Limited의 CEO이자 디렉터이신 브랜든 맥도날드님께서 아이언 프로젝트에 대한 소개를 해주신다고 합니다. 브랜든 맥도날드님은 세계 각 지역의 지질 조사 및 투자 전문가로서 과거 어, 맥콰이어 뱅크에서 리스크 관리 전문가로 근무하신 경력을 갖고 계십니다. 오랜 시간 동안 유콘주 지질 조사를 전담하고 계시고요. 현재는 파이어 위드 징스 리미티드의 CEO로 재직 중이라고 하는데요. 오늘 웨비나의 마지막 발표자인 만큼 여러분 끝까지 함께 주시기 바라겠습니다. So now it's time to introduce our final presentation and also presenter for today's event. So this time it will be delivered by Fire with Jinx CEO and Director, Mr. Brandon McDonald on the Macmillan Pest Jinx project. So he is a professional geologist who brings with him a wealth of experience in global exploration geology and investment banking. He has a long history of mining exploration work in Yukon and in the recent years, he has focused his efforts in exploration and development as a principal and consultant to various junior mining companies. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our final presenter. So if you're ready, you may begin your presentations. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for having me here today. So I'm going to be talking about fireweed zinc and uh, predominantly or entirely about our Macmillan Pass project, which is located in Yukon Territory, Canada. Um, to summarize, and I think a lot of this will be well understood by, by the people watching this presentation, uh, there's a transition now in, in terms of markets and we're seeing what we anticipate to be the beginning of a bull market for base metals. Uh, this is in part just a broad sector rotation, but also due to massive expected global stimulus on the back of, uh, you know, damage from COVID. Um, when you're thinking about infrastructure, of course, you think about zinc, you think about steel and the galvanization of it. Um, in terms of undeveloped zinc projects in the world, our Macmillan Pass is a absolute clear standout. Uh, not just in terms of scale and, and the economics, but in terms of how much there's left to explore and find there. Uh, the, the success we've seen there has attracted the likes of tech who invested in the company uh, and has gathered quite a bit of attention from other major global zinc players. Uh, and all of this has led to a program last year, which was quite game changing, including the discovery of a new zone in the Western part of our project. So broadly, our corporate philosophy has always been to treat our shareholders with respect, focus on long-term value creation, and make sure management has skin in the game. We are part of a group called the Discovery Group, which is an alliance of like-minded companies uh, with projects all over the world. So our project, the Millen Pass, uh, as you might've seen from Scott Castleman's presentation, is located in the Eastern part of Yukon territory. Uh, it's accessible by road, uh, the Cannell Road, we're able to get heavy equipment into there now, which is uh, uh, fortunate. 
Um, the project uh, had a resource and a PEA uh, wrapped around it in 2018. Uh, the numbers there were pretty excellent. So the resource 11.2 million tons indicated 39 and a half million tons of FERD at around 10% zinc equivalent. So pretty substantial contained metal numbers. Um, and that was used then to feed into a preliminary economic assessment, which hit all the sort of marks we wanted to see, healthy after-tax IRR, healthy after-tax NPV, manageable initial CapEx, and a long multi-cycle mine life. Uh, but what's critical when thinking about the 2018 resource and PEA is to understand how much has changed since 2018. Uh, the two main deposits, Tom and Jason, have had additional drilling that has expanded and improved them. Uh, we have a new zone in the West called the Boundary Zone, which does not yet have a resource on it. Uh, we've done additional engineering, and much like Paul and Casino, we have received significant commitment from the government to, improvement, uh, to improving the access roads to our project. So broadly speaking, the project is what we would consider a district scale project at 940 square kilometers. Uh, our land package traces a major district uh, scale fault uh, that was a basin bounding fault uh, some 400 million years ago. So these styles of deposits, uh, SEDEX deposits, so to speak, uh, form along these faults. So we know of four known deposits within this district. Um, most interestingly, and, and you know, the West, you know, we talked a little bit about Tom and Jason and the resource uh, there, but in the West, this new discovery of boundary zones seems to be a giant uh, system uh, drilling from 2019, 230 meters of four and a half percent zinc. That's true width. And that's right from surface. So the first hundred meters of that are 8.7% zinc from surface. So in terms of an open pit potential target, uh, pretty massive. 2020 drilling uh, followed up on that and showed a significant additional potential at boundary zone, sort of 212 meters of 4.4% zinc. Uh, and the mineralization of boundary zone, when you think about the classic SEDEX deposits, uh, which are like Red Dog, uh, Sullivan, Century, et cetera, uh, boundary zone for the most part did not seem to be like those. It was mostly uh, veining stock work, vein breaches, these thick veins. So quite, quite dissimilar to uh, Tom and Jason. Uh, so we put together a conceptual model that suggested that what we were seeing at Boundary Zone was a feeder system um, that where the fluids were coming up these faults, producing these veins, and hypothetically could be tapped into a barite horizon and result in a replacement deposit like we see at Tom and Jason and produce massive zinc and lead sulfides. So we took this theory, uh, which was developed in 2019, and applied some exploration in 2020, looking to see if we could find this barite cap where there might've been significant replacement. And we found that in this new discovery we called Boundary Zone West. So we see there Tom and Jason style stratiform mineralization. We see red dog style massive pyrite sphalerite. Uh, and we see at a deeper uh, second sequence of mineralization, how it's past style mineralization, which had previously never been seen before in this district. So the results in this new boundary west zone, uh, pretty impressive, uh, 76 meters of 4% zinc, including 26 grams silver, uh, you know, and, and then in the lower sequence, you can see 2.1% uh, zinc over 225 meters with localized uh, higher grade. Um, so this has been an area of extreme interest for us because we see um, not just the multiple sequences, uh, but the stratiform mineralization that is locally extremely high grade. So now considering that conceptual model that we had developed in 2019, we now think that uh, you know, the, the, the concept we have that this, there might be massive sulfide at the top above the boundary zone style mineralization has been demonstrated to be correct. And we now see this lower sequence of mineralization which we had previously not thought, even considered that it might exist. So this system at boundary zone is a, given the, the age width or breadth of rocks that it, it uh, mineralizes um, is obviously a very long lived system, very massive fluid flux with a deep crustal architecture. Uh, so we think this is the potential to be a, a truly massive deposit unto itself. And considering how large Tom and Jason are already, adding a, in, in a boundary zone that might be as large as them combined uh, would, would catapult this project 
to easily one of the top 10 Zinke projects in the world. So, and then building on top of that, you know, along this, this fertile cor corridor, we call it, um, that traces this major fault, uh, we see a significant amount of other exploration targets, any one of which uh, could be another one of these systems. Uh, so it's very easy to talk about uh, having a district scale project. For us, we, we believe this is truly a district because there are four known deposits tracing this structure and we see ample evidence for many more. So building from that, we think about the 2018 PEA as the, the core of this project, um, but we think about how much better the project has got since then. We've seen government funding for the road, which will directly offset our CapEx. Uh, we've seen engineering optim optimizations at Tom and Jason. Uh, we've seen resource expansion at Tom and Jason, and then potentially the integration of boundary zone, which in itself could be completely changed the scope and scale of the, the mining here, uh, and then additional blue sky exploration around the project. Each one of these has the potential to significantly change the MPV that we saw in 2018. So with that in mind, we work towards a new, uh, new updated PA and new global resource potentially next year in 2022, but quite likely in 2023, if we have enough success in drilling and want to continue that into 2022 to, to add to the, um, the library of, re of drill intersections we have. What we're really targeting here is something that could be a top 15 or top 10 uh, global zinc lead producer, certainly would be the largest held by a junior quite likely have a billion dollar plus MPV and would expect it to be in the first and second quartile costs. Uh, so that's the end of my presentation. If there are additional questions, please, please reach out to me. Uh, my email address is brandon at fireweedzinc.com and I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much.